ಮಹಾಕಾಯ ಸೂರ್ಯಕೋಟಿ ಸಮಪ್ರಭ ನಿರ್ವಿಘ್ನ ಕುರು ಮೇ ದೇವ ಸರ್ವಕಾರ್ಯು ಸರಸ್ವತಿ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ಕಾಮೇ ವಿದ್ಯಾರಂಭಂ ಕರಿಷ್ಯಾಮಿ ಸಿದ್ಧರ್ಭವತ ಮೇ ಸದಾ ವ್ರಜೆ ಸರ್ವಲೋಕ ಭಗರೋಗಿಷ್ಣಾಮೂರ್ತೇ ಗುರುರಾಧ್ವೇತಿ ಮೂರ್ತಿಭೇದ ವಿಭಾಗಿನೆ ಯೋ ಮದ್ಯಾಪ್ತೇಘಾ ದಕ್ಷಿಣಾಮೂರ್ತ ನಮಃ ಸದಾ ಶಿವ ಸಂಭಾ ಶಂಕರಾಚಾರ್ಯ ಮಧ್ಯ ಅಸ್ಮದಾಚಾರ್ಯ ಪರ್ಯಂತ ವಂದೇ ಗುರು ಪರಂಪರ ಗುರುರ್ಬ್ರಹ್ಮ ಗುರುರ್ವಿಷ್ಣು ಗುರುರ್ದೇವೋ ಮಹೇಶ್ವರ ಗುರು ಸಾಕ್ಷಾತ್ ಪರಂ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮ ತಸ್ಮೈ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರವೇ ನಮಃ ಓ ಸಹನಾವತು ಸಹನೌ ಭುನಕ್ತು ಸಹ ವೀರ್ಯಂಕರ ವಾವಹೈ ತೇಜಸ್ವಿನಾವಧೇತಮಸ್ತು ಮಾಭಿಷಾವಹೈ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಶಾಂತಶಾಂತಿ ವಾಸುದೇವೇಂದ್ರಯೋಗೀಂದ್ರ ಮುಕ್ಷೂನಾಧೀಯತೆ ಸಾಧನ ಚತುಷ್ಟಯ ಸಂಪನ್ನಾಧಿಕಾರಿ ಮೋಕ್ಷ ಸಾಧನ ಭೂತ ತತ್ವಿವೇಕ ಪ್ರಕಾರ ಸಾಧನ ಚತುಷ್ಟಯಂತ್ಯವಸ್ತು ವಿವೇಕ ಸಾರಿ ನಿತ್ಯವಸ್ತು ವಿವೇಕ ಮುತ್ರಾರ್ಥಭೋಗ ಶಿ ಷಟ್ಕ ಸಂಪತ್ತಿ ಮುಮುಕ್ಷುತ್ವೇತಿ ನಿತ್ಯವಸ್ತು ವಿವೇಕ ನಿತ್ಯವಸ್ತು ನಿತ್ಯವಸ್ತು ತದ್ವ್ಯತಿರಿಕ್ತಿತ್ಯ ಇಹಸ್ವರ್ಗೋಗೇಶು ಇಚ್ಛಾರಾಧಿತ್ಯ ಇಹಸ್ವರ್ಗೋಗೇಶು ಇಚ್ಛಾರಾಧಿತ್ಯ 
மனோ Okay, now we can mute your mic. Shamaha Kaha. What is Shamaha? Shamaha is defined as Mano Nigraha. Shamaha is mastery over mind. We have seen uh, Shama in the last class, but we will see some more points. Shama, then we will see the mom. So Shamaha, when you translate this Mano Nigraha as mind control, it's a, it is that translation mind control, it leads us to the thinking of suppressing the mind. Sup suppression of mind and mastery over mind, both are entirely two different things. They are not synonymous. We must know the uh, difference between these two. A suppressed mind will always wait for the right occasion to rise and once the chance arises, it will take you for a ride. A suppressed mind is a slave mind. It can explode any day and turn your life upside down. It can lead to other mental complications. Suppression, it implies that still the mind is your, is your master. You are the servant of your mind. So control, control implies that you are trying to veins of the mind chariot tightly all the time. It's a tough job. It is exhausting thing. Whereas mastery over mind implies that the mind will not do anything without your will. The mind will not do anything without your permission. It will always wait for your order. And once it gets the order, it will faithfully execute it. Mastery over mind means you are the master. The mind is the servant. It means the mind is doing what it is supposed to do. That is the mastery over mind. In suppression, you don't study the ways of the mind. You whip the mind all the time. The mind is hurt. So the mind will take revenge on you as though it is an another conscious being in you. Whereas in mind mastery, you have clearly studied the mind and you know how to direct it in the right direction to accomplish what you want in life. In fact, our whole culture, our whole tradition, our daily religious routines and practices, they are all aimed at mastery over our mind. In suppression, there is no support of mind for you. Whereas in mastery, you don't need the support of your mind. Remember, mind is not an enemy. Therefore, you don't need to suppress it. You don't need to conquer it. There is no conquest. It's all about training. It's about tra training the instrument, the mind, to serve our purpose. In fact, the mind is being what it is. We should get trained to trained how to use it. It is like driving a car. So you should know the controls and learn to drive the car if you want to reach the your reach your destination. Is a car getting trained or you? Car is an instrument. Therefore, you should get trained. Car is a, just a mechanical device. You need to know the controls and a bit of mechanism to drive the car. Whereas here in the mind, the mind is conscious. It is also an instrument. It is conscious because of you and you must learn to use it. You get trained to use the mind because mind is an instrument. Using it without getting trained, it's like the piloting the aircraft without being, without getting trained. So, the training the mind 
is very in training you get trained and use the instrument mind that is important there are uh, various mental disorders various types of mental disorders like uh, the bipolar disorder with the personality disorder obsessive compulsive disorder psychotic disorder anxiety disorder there are so many types of disorders mental disorders are there if you see for every mental disorder there is a corresponding physical disorder so therefore there is no physical health without mental health even from the point view point of uh, physical health we need to have certain mastery over our mind mental health is required people with serious mental health conditions they are at high risk of experiencing the chronic physical conditions so at least for the sake of physical health we need to take care of our mental well being therefore it is all the more required to lead a disciplined regulated life of spiritual growth that is damaha in fact it is worth spending one whole life in gaining mastery over mind rather than indulging in rather than suppressing it mind is an instrument it is a karanam it is meant for knowing it is meant for remembering smaranam it is also for entertaining emotions because it is instrumental in knowing it is called an antakaranam antaha means inner karanam is instrument so it is inner instrument antakaranam without the mind you cannot know anything mind is a instrument a karanam through which we know like the eyes are the karanam through which we see ears are the karanam the instrument through which we hear but the eyes ears and all the other karanam cannot function themselves without being backed by the mind only when the mind is there eyes are eyes eyes can see only when the ear is backed up by the mind ear will be ear it can do its function therefore so you come to recognize something only with the help of mind with all your sense organs you come to recognize something only with the help of mind and therefore mind is also a a karana it is a antakarana mind is also the seat of all the emotions as well as the seat of knowledge therefore there is an emotional mind there is a cognitive mind there is a recollecting mind because mind it is this is it's a it's a store house of data the knowledge memory therefore it is a recollecting mind now if a person is disturbed they bothered who is bothered who is disturbed really speaking it is the person that is bothered not the mind not the mind that really bothers because mind is just an instrument but the mind seems to play a role in botheration how in creating certain emotions like take for instance fear fear is for the person not for the mind please understand fear is for the person not for the mind the person is afraid and the mind informs him the mind reflects his emotion not that the mind is afraid therefore the person is afraid the poor mind is unnecessarily blamed it is a person who is afraid and therefore there is an emotion called fear it is the same for all emotions like uh, anxiety hatred compassion love there are emotions like compassion love empathy which the mind reflects compassion only reveals that the person is compassionate the emotion compassion it informs that the person is basically a compassionate person therefore in understanding emotions we always have to include the person if we exclude the person the mind just it will become a whipping boy for all other emotional issues an emotion is nothing but me when when you view from the standpoint of the mind with reference to an emotion called compassion i am compassionate because i am compassionate there is compassion because i am loving there is love it is not the other way around it is not that because there is love i become loving but rather because i am loving there is love 
So, so too, in the same way, because I am frightened, there is fear. Because I am agitated, there is agitation. Because I am anxious, therefore, there is anxiety. If that is so, then why do we separate the mind and then whip it all the time? Neither do I have to whip myself nor the mind. I am what I am because of certain laws. So, whenever we talk about the mind, we have to be highly responsible, not the mind. Mind is just an instrument. It all, it's always good. It does its job. If you are anxious, the mind presents anxiety for you. But the mind doesn't cause you anxiety. The mind is not a threat. The mind is just you. It just reflects your emotions. You are the person, you are the affected person, the disturbed person, and the mind gives an indication that you have to pay a certain attention in some areas that you can resolve all those emotional issues with yourself. All the emotions like this anxiety, depression, anger, which arise in the mind, it reveals a person. It is not that the person experiences the emotions of the mind and becomes the corresponding emotional person, but the mind reveals the emotions arising in the person. The person is nothing but a bundle of emotions which he carries from the past experiences. If anger is there, I must understand that there is already an angry person. There is an, already an angry person in me who manifests in the form of anger. It is a mind that really tells us exactly what the person is. It is a mind which tells us to what emotion the person is given to. That mind is pointed out as Mano Nigraha, not the person, because we understand the person through the mind alone. There are varieties of emotions uh, which we have, not to our liking, or for that matter to anyone. I don't like myself being given to anger. I don't like myself to myself being anxious. I don't like myself being getting frightened. So, how are we going to gain a resolution of this? Though there are many methods, one common thing is that we have to accept the emotion. If I am frightened, I am frightened. Thinking that I should not be frightened, it's not going to help me. Or the idea that I should not have been frightened is also not going to help me. The notion that I should not be frightened or should not have been frightened only, it confuses the whole situation. The mind is just an indicator of the person. The mind should be available for my understanding of things. The mind should be available for pursuing my goals. The mind should be available for contemplation, dhyana. That availability is exactly what is called Shamaha. The subject matter of Vedanta being myself is me and because it is me, I have to deal with myself. Because it is me, I am nothing but a bundle of emotions. I cannot bypass emotion. There is no bypassing because I have to deal with myself. In bypassing a problem, we are not bypassing the problem really. We are bypassing in solving the problem. It means what? There is no solution. Therefore, Shamaha is complete availability of the mind for pursuing our goals, our Purusharta. It is not that the mind should become blank, but rather the mind, you make the mind available for you. That is Shamaha. When I sit in contemplation, the mind should be available for me. When I study a book or when I read an article, the mind should be available for me. When I study Sanskrit, when I study Sanskrit grammar, the mind should be available for me. So, when I sit and listen, the mind should be available for me. When it is available for me, then why do you bother about the mind? The mind is serving you. The mind is a servant. It is serving you. It is, sometimes it is cognitively available for you. And sometimes it disturbs you. It looks like the mind disturbs you, but in fact, it is already a disturbed mind. Already the, your mind is disturbed and therefore you want to get rid of the disturbance. For instance, the disturbance which is already in you, an old disturbance, 
it can manifest in the form of fear. The fear which was locked up inside, which was buried underneath, it manifests. That fear, it gets released. We have to understand this situation very clearly. The more we understand, the more Shama we will command. The fear, for instance, you can look at, look at, it, look at the fear as a fear released. It is a fear released rather than a fear gained. Similarly, you can look at anxiety as an anxiety released rather than an anxiety gained. If you look at, at anxiety as a new gain, then naturally you, will, you are going to conclude that you are anxious. It means that you don't understand the piled up anxiety in you is venting its way through recognizing it. You should let all the anxiety go, all the old pain go, let all the old hatred, jealousy and whatever that we don't want which is lying underneath, all should go. So, by exhibiting these emotions, we are letting it go, we are, we are letting it go, we are releasing those emotions, we are not gaining, they are going away from you more than coming, especially when you address the problem. So, when you are not addressing the problem, you don't know what is happening. When you are depressed, you are depressed, that's all. In the Vedanta, in the study of Vedanta, we are addressing the problem because we are the subject matter. We are, look at, we are looking at ourselves. So, naturally, when you look at ourselves, all these emotions, it should come out, it will come out. The, the, the more you are able to look at all the emotions with a sense of surrender, the more Shama will be there. Surrender, Sharanagati. Sharanagati to what? Sharanagati to Ishwara, Parmeshwara. Parmeshwara means which includes the, the Ishwara, which includes the, the order, the whole order, Psycho including the psychological order. That order is Ishwara. This uh, regarding Ishwara and the order, we will discuss in detail later. That is an important topic. It is a separate topic. We will discuss it later. So, through all our uh, daily prayers, Dainandina Prarthana, through our meditations, our Upasana and our Japa, dhya, our duties, regular daily duties, whether it is Nitya, Naimitika Karma, through all this, what we do is, we take care of the mind. If, by continuously doing all those things, we, we make the mind available for us. The availability of the mind, that is what is called Shamaha. There is mental time available. When mental time is available, naturally you will have physical time. If mental time is available, physical time will accommodate always. Mental time is not available for some people because their mind is too busy. It's too busy, in, it means it is not available for them. Previously, in our people were leading their religious life. So, therefore, it was very easier for them to uh, command Shama. They were doing Nitya Naimitika Karma, they were regular in doing Japa. They had led a very disciplined life. Therefore, more or less the mind was available for them. In leading a religious life, you, one finds a certain bonding with Ishwara, Parameshwara. And in that bonding, the person can relax and resolve all the emotional issues. As I said before, this is something, an important topic which we will be discussing in detail at the right place. But, uh, but you understand now, the, 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 all the religious disciplines which we have in our culture, it is, it is for developing this Shema. If one leads a religious life seriously, then the Shema naturally will, be, will take place, Shema will be there. Shema is complete availability, availability of the mind for you to accomplish your life goals, Purushartha. And for Moksha, it is all the more required. Now, the disciple asks the, the next question. Damaha Kaha. You can uh, repeat after me. Damaha Kaha. Damaha Kaha. Chakshuradi Bhagyendriya Nikraha Chakshuradi Bhagyendriya Nikraha Okay. Um, Chakshuradi Chakshuhu Adi 
Actually, it is one word. Chakshurari Bhagendriya Nigraha. Okay. Fine. You can now mute your mic. What is Damaha? Damaha, Kaha. So, Damaha is uh, masculine, therefore, Kaha is there. Shamaha, Kaha, Damaha, Kaha. It's a very simple question. Damaha, Kaha. Chakshuradi Bhagendriya Nigraha Damaha. That is Chakshuradi Bhagendriya. Mastery over the external sense organs such as I, etc. Chakshu Adi. Mastery over the external Bhagya Indriya. That was external sense organs. Mastery over sense organs as well as organs of action, both. That is what here, Bhagya Indriya. Organs of action or sense organs, organs of knowledge. We will be saying what are they in detail later. It will be covered in Tattva itself. We will see that later. Now here the author says Chakshuhu Adi Bhagyendriya Nikraha. Chakshuhu. Chakshuhu means eyes. Chakshuhu eyes. Adi Chakshuhu Adi. Adi is etc. What is what is this etc. Adi? It will. What does it mean? What does it bring? Adi, it will Adi, it will bring the members of the same jati, same species. Jati means family. Here, Chakshu Adi. Here, Adi means not lion, tiger, dog, goat. No, Adi. When you say Adi, means that Adi padat. It will bring the the members of the same family. For example, if you say Sadhana Chatushtayam, Sadhana Chatushtayam. It includes Viveka, Vairagya, Shamadi Chatka Sampattihi, Mukshutpa. You cannot say Sadhana Chatushtayam includes Viveka, Vairagya, Shamadi Chatka Sampattihi, Mukshutpa Adi. There is no Adi. Mukshutpa is the last one in Sadhana Chatushtayam. Therefore, there is nothing is left out after Mukshutpa. Therefore, no Adi. But here Chakshu Adi means what? Adi Padat, that is going to come. The other Indriya, which is not mentioned, which is understood. Similarly, when you say uh, the five elements, earth, water, fire, air, space, you cannot say the five elements are earth, water, fire, air, space, etc. You cannot use etc. This uh, loose use of etc. is due to lack of Dhamaha. This loose, looseness is lack of Dhamaha. What you say, you mean it. You say something and afterwards you say, I didn't mean at all. Sometimes you do say something without saying the other meanings possible. Then you can say, I did not mean. That is okay. That is not a lack of Dhamaha. But when you say something and afterwards you say, I didn't mean it, then it is lack of Dhamaha. So therefore, Dhamaha here is being alert. Alert with reference to sense organs starting from Chakshu, Chakshu is eyes. So, Damaha is management of sense organs. Shamaha is manage, managing the mind. Damaha is managing the sense organs. See, this Shamaha and Damaha, it is not only the definition. We must know what it is in detail. That is why I spent the whole one class in dealing with Shama and now dealing with Dhamma. It is not just knowing the definition. It is knowing and leading the alert life. That is what it's all about. So, now Damaha is managing the sense organs. Our scriptures, it does never, uh, scriptures, they don't believe in suppression. Any form of suppression, it is always dangerous because it has the potential to explode, either now or later. So, by management, we mean Intelligently directing the directing the sense organs, intelligently channelizing them. We should not allow the sense organs to go wherever they want. We should direct them to go where we want, where we decide to go. So it is like a damming a river. If the dams are not constructed, what will happen to the water? The water resources will go to the ocean and it will be a waste. 
So by constructing a dam, we will be saving the huge water resources so that the same water can be channelized to uh, the for irrigation purposes to areas that, that we want. We can channelize them. Similarly, here also, Nidraha means not allowing the sense organs to go wherever they want, but deciding to, to send them the direction where we want. For example, when a student comes to the class, his ears should be directed towards what the teacher teaches. But if sense organs are not cooperative, he will be physically present, but he will not hear. If he is ear and can hear, then it means he has Indriya Nigraha. Now, why do we insist upon proper direction of uh, sense organs? Why do we say sense, sensory management is required? There are several reasons. One reason is that our mental condition is dependent on our sense organs because sense organs are alone at the gates. They are the gate. Gates are the gatekeepers. They are the doors for the external world to enter our mind. They decide which part of the world, which sound must enter us, which form must enter us, which smell must enter us. So what enters our mind is determined by the sense organs. And if these organs are not properly managed, anything and everything will enter our mind and that will create a problem. All the, the external things, external objects which are not conducive for our spiritual welfare can enter our mind and it can create a lot of disturbances. Therefore, we need to have a check. We need to manage them. Whatever can disturb our mind for such things, we should have a, a strict policy, no admission policy. We should put no admission. The sense organs acting as a uh, the door should be shut down, should not allow those things to enter our mind and that is called Tamaha. Indriya, Indriya means organ. It is, uh, Indriya is uh, neuter gender. Indriyam, Indriye, Indriyani. So, Indriya means organ. There are two sets of Indriyas. Indriyani. One is Antar Indriyam. Antar Indriyam or Antar Indriyani. Bhagavachana. Antar Indriyani means inner organs. And the other one is Bhagir Indriyam. Bhagya Indriyam. Bhagya Indriyani. External organs. Antar Indriyam is mind. Which we have seen in detail under Shama. Here it is with a reference to Bhagyendriyam, Bhagirindriyani, Bhagyendriyani, external sense organs. Bhagyendriyani is also of two, 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 two sets. One is organs externally available for perception. That is one, one set. The other set is the organs which are externally available for action. One is Jnanaendriyani and the other one is Karmaendriyani. So, Bhagyaendriyani is divided into two sets. One is Jnanaendriyani, other one is Karmaendriyani. The sense organs are the, like the inlets and action organs are the outlets. So, there are five organs of action. With reference to them also, we should have a mastery over it. The sense organs are just instruments. They should listen to what I say. I should not listen to what the sense organs dictate. For example, the uh, tongue. Tongue should not dictate me what I should take. Then I become the slave of the tongue. I should eat what, I mean, it should, the tongue should eat what I ask it to eat. I cannot command the tongue to taste differently what it touches. No. But I have the power with me to make it taste and eat even when the food is bitter, like uh, Kaila, which most of us don't like it. I remember uh, Swami Shivananda says, even if you don't have anything delicious to eat, and if you have only rice soaked in water, you should train yourself to eat it with, even with no salt, without any repulsion. That is the, uh, the Nigraha. Similarly, the eyes, eyes should see what I ask 
to see. Eyes will like seeing something tempting. Ears will like hearing something tempting. I should be able to say no, no to the eyes, no to the ears. That is called mastery over sense organs. Called Damaha. Okay. Now, how to control the eyes, how to control the ears, how to control the other sense organs. Should I close my eyes when I see something bad? Should I plug my ears when I hear something uh, bad? Damaha is not closing the eyes, not having the earplugs in the ears. The job of eyes is to see. I simply see. Ears will let you hear the sounds. They are, simple, they are simply reporters. They have intelligence. They are not intelligent. They don't ask you to go after the sense objects. They are just reporters. When eyes see a sari shop, they don't say go inside. When you see a latest model, mobile phone in the shop, they don't ask you to go and buy immediately. Sense organs don't say that. You decide and go after it. Bhagavan Krishna says in the fifth chapter of the Gita, Bhagya Sparsheshva Sattatma Vindatyatmani Yatsukam Sabrimma Yoga Yuktatma Sukam Akshayam Ashnute Sparshan Krutva Bhagir Bhagyan Chakshus Chaibantare Bhrugohu Prana Pano Samo Krutva Nasa Bhintara Charinu 27th Shloka, this Sparshan Krutva Bhagir Bhagyan. This is an important Shloka. This is the shloka with uh, which we in the ashram we start our meditation. Somebody teaches meditation. Sparshan Krutva Bhaget Bhagyan. Here the Krishna, Bhagavan Krishna says, this Shabda, Sparsha, Rupa, Rasa, Ganda, all these sense objects are external. They are external. So keep them external. You don't bring them inside. But what happens? They get internalized. We bring them inside and they we get and they get internalized. Keep the external external things external. But the problem is we always internalize all the external vishayas. Sense organs are good reporters, they are faithful reporters, they report what they perceive. They are not like our NDTV reporters facing the data. Sense organs report the sensor objects. But what happens? Sense objects create certain fancies in us. In fact, it is not a sense object that create fancies. It is uh, our fancies for sense objects which are stored inside. It get triggered to come out. Fancies means a kind of desire, a situation that will tend to desire something. Everyone has a lot of, got a lot of fancies, but we don't go after them. As you walk on the market street, you see a lot of boys and girls and you want to marry every one of them. But it is a fancy, you don't go after them. Satsangascha vivekascha nirmalam nayanadvayam yashenasti narasondaha tatam nasyat amar gadaha The person who, do, who don't have these two eyes, what are they? One eye is the satsanga, the company of the noble people. The other is viveka. The person doesn't have these two eyes, then how can he not tread the wrong path? How can he not tread the wrong path? Therefore, do not submit to any kind of external stimulus and and think before going after what your senses report on the sense objects. We should use the jnana chakshu, not the, the external chakshu. Use a jnana chakshu. The clarity in thinking, that knowledge is in Jnana Chakshu. Whatever physical Chakshu, physical eyes report is about, it gives a data about the object. But use your Jnana Chakshu, the knowledge, whether to go after it or to restrain from going after it. We, 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 we always keep on internalizing many fancies. Sensors are, as I told, it are just mere reporters and there is nothing to control. In at all, something to control, you have managed, you have to manage your fancies. So, don't, let us not go after the fancies set up by the senses. Let us not get trapped in the fancies, the imaginations. Sense organs bring in sense objects, sense objects and with those data, we create fancies. Let the fancies remain fancies. 
that is what bhagwan krishna says that the external things remain external even though you feel like going after them but you don't go after that that is called dhamaha when you feel like eating more even after you have finished your regular meal you don't submit to that impulse when you can say enough even if you have the desire to enjoy more food that is called dhamaha you have got certain say over it to say no to it that is dhamaha ooraye ashane nardham tritiyam udakenatu vayu sanchara narthaya chaturtham avasheshaye this is a very good uh, subhashitam it says fill your stomach half with solid food and the third quarter for water leave the fourth quarter for the moment of air in fact start stopping that for with reference to external objects any external objects when you say no to it at the right time that is called damaha that is the mastery over your sense organs when you when you have woken up in the morning and still if you want to stay on the bed for some more time say no that is damaha so that for damaha it has to be practiced all the time and damaha it has to be practiced when shama is not there this is another important thing damaha has to be practiced all the more when shama is not there when someone says something about you your your mind immediately wants to react to it at that time there is no shama because you, your mind wants to react to it there is no shama then you require dhamma that shama being not there what you require is dhamma because your mind already reacted that for shama is not there so what you need there dhamma if shama is there then there is no need for dhamma when you lose shama then you must have dhamma i will explain this suppose you are angry now the anger has come 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 uh, has entered you once the anger has entered it means it's an indication that you don't have shama lack of shama the anger shows that there is no shama i am an angry person now this is a fact this expression of anger of course it is not going to be a pleasant experience for me especially for the opponent in anger i be, i cannot be reasonable i cannot be rationally angry in anger my intelligence doesn't function my buddhi doesn't function the mind which is the seat of emotions and buddhi it is now totally occupied by the emotion fear sorry anger in anger there is no space between me and the emotion emotion anger my identification is complete with the angry person the anger takes complete control of me therefore that cannot be that that cannot be a, a reasonable or rational expression of anger the very fact that rational person in me is hijacked by the emotional person angry person so what can we do in a such a situation in such a situation what can we do is we can we can stop the conversation with the person to stop the conversation with the person i should discover in me a certain space which gives me to to stop a conversation because before the conversation turns to a, a verbal fight due to my anger when somebody said something i received it and got hurt and that is internalization then i respond which is anger i want to say something it indicates that i have missed shama lack of shama now you bring in dhamma you don't express anything you don't add that is dhamma if you miss shama have dhamma that is the bhagyendriya nigraham suppose if the other person is angry then what will you do we have to draw a boundary saying that we will that we will talk later if the other person doesn't agree you have to walk away because it even when you walk away it may further anger the other person but it is his problem it is not our business 
when i am angry i should have the space within me to stop the conversation i have i should have the freedom to stop the conversation i should intelligently stop the conversation and tell the other person i am angry and i don't want to converse now we should learn to develop it that is what is called defining a boundary at least at the level of talking at the level of restraining the tongue for further uttering angry words and creating a better situation physically shutting it out the expression of anger by stopping the conversation that is damaha anger it is not a deliberate emotion for that matter any emotion is not a deliberate one it just happens anger happens in me for that for that mind mind is not the reason instead of doing research on the reason of anger which we can do later first we have to recognize the anger and try to resolve it the the only way by which anger can be resolved is only by expression not by suppression not by any other means here viveka also will not help by saying that anger is not good i should not get angry it is not going to help me self blame or getting to victim mode it is not going to help me anger has already happened in me and we should and i should try to resolve it viveka it is helpful only before the anger happens once the anger has happened then we should try to resolve it the so dhamma is an it's an it is an external expression in which the emotion is restrained i stop the conversation with the person and that is dhamma though my mind agitated there was a reaction in my mind it indicates i don't have shama but at the physical level i have restrained my i have restrained by stopping the conversation i have restrained my tongue by for uttering by uttering some angry words that is the dhamma so dhamma is an external expression in which an emotion is restrained shama is appropriate expression of emotions if anger is there then what is the appropriate expression somebody used to say that you write it out whatever your mind says whatever you want to say or you find a you find a friend or you talk to your friend and let your heart pour out to him or uh, you guess uh, another uh, thing um, it may look like a joke but it is not a joke it is something uh, uh, serious one which somebody advises he says that you take the towel you wet your towel you soak it in the water and wet the towel and beat the floor that is uh, one way of uh, letting out your anger the anger we have to let it out that we have to give a way for our emotions to go out we should find the appropriate situation occasion to let it go and that is called uh, the dhamma so this uh, these are the some of the methods which samaji uh, openly advocates in the, in the in the class and he also says don't read the book how to control anger and all those things they are all uh, uh, they are all just simple advices which won't work so now if shama is there suppose if we have shama then we don't need dhamma because you control all your emotions at the mental level itself therefore you don't need to have i mean not control manage you don't need to manage at the sense level so when shama is there we don't need dhamma when shama is not there then we need dhamma that is why when the disciple last even even in the uh, this, um, shama uh, shamadi shakta sampatti the first one is shama the next one is dhamma that is why the question is shama kaha comes first dhamma is later dhamma is mentioned after shama therefore now we understand that dhamma is appropriate expression of our emotions appropriate behavior being alert to what i do feeling being alert to my expression that is called dhamma we go on doing a variety of actions in our life when we are aware of what we do then it is dhamma even when you use your hands and legs use it, use it very consciously you can see some people um, shaking their legs or hands 
mechanically. I have seen in my class students they keep shaking their uh, ties. They don't. They are not aware that they are shaking their ties, but they keep doing it. Every time I have to point out to them and and ask them to stop it. So it clearly shows there is no dhamma. So don't do anything which you are not aware of. That says that you don't have dhamma. I'll give an instance, uh, even um, an example. This is a common ex common experience which uh, we all experience. Even uh, when you lock the door, when you lock your uh, the house door, we get a doubt. Did I lock the door? When you lock the door, you are not aware of what you are doing. You have locked the door, but you are but you are not conscious of locking the door. So when you you you, you go and again you come back to check up whether you lock the door or not. At the time of checking, also you are not conscious of what you are doing because something you are you are checking it mechanically. Then again you go back and think, did I check the uh, locking? So this clearly shows that the lack of dhamma. You do certain actions, and it is purely mechanical. You are not. You are not physically. You are physically present. You are mentally absent, and also because your mind is not there, naturally, what happens? Your uh, sense organs, sense organs will do the job mechanically because your mind is not there. The action will not be registered, and that clearly shows that you don't have dhamma. Therefore, we should be more aware of what we are doing, more conscious of what we do, how much we talk, what we talk. So, in all this, a certain alertness should be there, and that is called dhamma. You are a conscious person. Be conscious of yourself. Be conscious of what you are doing. Then only you can get rid of that mechanicalness. The mechanicalness should go away. For that, we need to practice dhamma. If you ask how to get dhamma, but only by being alert. And also the same religious practices that which I mentioned in the previous class, which help one to get shama, that is also the means for getting dhamma. Any type of sadhana, any type of sadhana uh, which you do, in which you say no to certain things, it's a, that is a religious discipline. That is nothing but dhamma. For example, we don't take. Uh, uh, rice products in the night on the days we do tarpan, particularly this on Amavasya and all these days. That is Dhamma. Deliberately, we, we, we have con control over, we have over the food, what we take. Similarly, we fast on Ekadeshi. We observe Maunam one, weekly once. So, these are all the, the means for Dhamma. In the tradition, in our culture, they are all built in our day to day routine. In the form of uh, the vrtas, in the form of our festivals, in the form of our religious disciplines, we don't know all those things why we do. But now you can see the place of everything, everything in in that in our life. They are all meant to get mastery over our mind, mastery over our senses, to gain the capacity to do things consciously. There is no alternative but to practice doing things consciously, consciously talk. Consciously eat, consciously walk, do things consciously. This abhyasa, abhyasa is important. Practice is important. We may be mechanical, but we should make deliberate efforts to do consciously. Only by doing it deliberately, we we get an alertness. We gain an alert. We live an alert life. So this abhyasa, this doing things consciously. That is very important. That is the only way by which we can practice dhamma. That is the only way by which we gain the capacity to do things consciously. That is how dhamma is gained. Now the uh, next qualification is the disciple asks a question. You can uh, chant with me. Uh, repeat after me. Upara maha kaha. Uparamaha. 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 
உபரமக அப்படின்னு உபரமக ரூபரத்துக்கு போட்டார் ஓகே உபரம ஹக்தக உபரமானுஷ்டானம் Swadharma Anushtan. Swa is one's own. Dharma is duties. Dharma is duties. So Swadharma Anushtanam Eva Uparamaha. The more uh, detail on Uparamaha we will see in the next steps. Om Purnamadav Purnamidham Purnat Purnamudachate பூர்ணய பூர்ணமாதாய பூர்ணமேவாசிஷ்யோ நம Hmm.